Hello and welcome to Food Tank's webinar series. My name is Sarah Small and I'm Food Tank's Chief of Staff. I'm really excited about today's webinar with Dr. Sunny Ramaswamy. He was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as Director for the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, or NIFA. NIFA provides funding to catalyze transformative discoveries, education, and engagement to solve societal challenges. In this webinar, Dr. Ramaswamy will be pre presenting on the future of food and agriculture, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture's role. So we're really thrilled to have him here today, and this webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards. You can also follow along and participate on Twitter using hashtag foodtank, and please do submit your questions in the chat box or email them to sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at foodtank.com. So without further ado, Sunny, it's really an honor to have you here today, and I'm excited to hear your presentation, so I'll give you the floor now. All right, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Sarah, for uh, having me as part of this conversation that uh, the food tank is uh, engaged in, uh, you know, very impressive uh, speakers that you have had. I'm honored to be uh, part of the community as well to share some thoughts about uh, the kind of work that is uh, needed as we project out uh, in regards to the food and agricultural enterprise. And particularly from my perspective, the role that we've got for my agency the uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, we're one of 18 agencies within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, as, as probably your listeners know, uh, it includes everything from food safety to marketing to risk management uh, to uh, economics and statistics and things like that. So the my agency, NIFA, as we call it, uh, our role is to support the, uh, the transformative discoveries that, were, that are needed in addressing the societal challenges pertaining to food and agriculture. And also, it's not knowledge for the sake of knowledge as much as taking that knowledge and to actually translate that into innovations and solutions and to deliver to the end users as well. So this afternoon, in the next about half hour or so, I want to, uh, or this morning as the case might be, depending on where your listeners are uh, that are tuned in, uh, that I'm going to spend about a half hour or so sharing with you uh, our take on the future of food and agriculture and, and our role, NIFA's role in this. And, uh, and then I hope uh, we have uh, plenty of time for a, a rich conversation as well. So I like to say that uh, we have an existential threat. And uh, this existential threat is uh, nutritional security. And a few years ago, I stopped using the terms food security, in part because it is nutritional outcomes that we must all be uh, uh, trying to help achieve. And uh, indeed, uh, we've got some very significant challenges because of the type of uh, food that we consume. Uh, indeed, uh, Ursula Bauer with the Centers for Disease Control has undertaken some exquisite uh, research on this topic. And, and she says that 75% uh, of America's healthcare costs are attributable to uh, uh, chronic disease. And uh, chronic disease itself is the result of genetics. That's certainly a part of uh, uh, what contributes to chronic disease. But in addition to genetics, it's the food, particularly the amount of calories we consume and the quality of calories we consume, and along with that, our sedentary lifestyles and behaviors as well. But it really comes down to food itself. And in fact, Ursula, in a second study, uh, discovered that you can be a complete couch potato and uh, uh, you know change the type of calories you consume, the number of calories you consume, and that in and of itself can get you better health outcomes as well. And so this idea about nutritional security and as an existential threat, you know, we all frame our conversations about uh, you know the year 2050, something something bad's going to happen at that time, climate change and the diminishing land and water resources and things like that are all going to have an impact. And, but I like to think that it's happening right now. We see the consequences of climate change already. The new species of uh, invasive uh, insects and pathogens and weeds that we're seeing, the uh, impacts on public health, uh, uh, our ability to produce food, the droughts that we've been seeing, the intense weather events that we're seeing. These are all happening right now, not something that's gonna happen in the year 2050. I think what's gonna happen in the year 2050 is it's only gonna get exacerbated where we not to go ahead and address some of these externalities that we've got. And I'm gonna come back to those externalities in just a little bit. But immediately in regards to nutrition itself, again, uh, you know, going back to some of the work that's already been done, that's been supported by NIFA, as well as the work undertaken by others, supported by other agencies and the private sector as well, tells us 
For example, in America, we've got 17 million households. The Economic Research Service tells us 17 million households. That's about 50 million plus people are going to have challenges in meeting their food needs today. In a, in a country where we know how to feed the entire world, so, and yet we've got 17 million households that are food insecure. And uh, along with that, we've also got a number of people, one in five actually in America, uh, before we're going to bed tonight, we'll have to take Lipitor for cholesterol, they have to take baby aspirin for heart disease, they have to take medication for hypertension, they have to take medication for type 2 diabetes and things like that, these so-called cardiovascular diseases itself. So when you look at these two situations and you project that out at a global level, you discover that globally, tonight, we're going to have about 800 million people that will go to bed hungry. And of those 800 million people tonight, almost about 30,000 people will drop dead because of lack of food. And the flip side of it is globally, we'll have 1.3 billion people that'll have to, that'll go to bed tonight and before going to bed, we'll have to take these medications to deal with their metabolic disorders, such as baby aspirin and Lipitor and, and metformin and other drugs as well to, to maintain some semblance of normalcy in their lives. Oh, by the way, of that 1.3 billion people tonight, approximately about 50,000 people will drop dead because of the metabolic disorders that they have been subject to as well. And then when you look at children, particularly in America, uh, we've got a situation where a third of our uh, population of children is either overweight or obese. And, and indeed in the States, uh, as, as our, you know, your listeners know, starting in the late 1800s, every generation has lived a little bit longer than the immediately preceding generation to where in the year 2016, men and women in America live to be about 80 years of age, and women live a little bit longer uh, than do men. And the sad situation is that, unfortunately, children born in the first decade of this century are going to have a shorter lifespan than their parents. And again, it's the result of the excessive amounts of calories being consumed, the sedentary lifestyles and behaviors. And indeed, some of your uh, listeners probably saw in 60 Minutes here a couple of months ago uh, where uh, this particular segment on 60 Minutes was on Pima Indians. And the children amongst the Pima Indians had uh, significant levels of uh, obesity and being overweight, uh, type 2 diabetes, and indeed children having to take metformin for type 2 diabetes, not juvenile diabetes that we all worried about. You know, we've even got the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation and things like that. But type 2 diabetes and having to take medication for hypertension, these are adult onset diseases. These are diseases of older people. And yet children in, in America have to resort to taking these drugs as well. That is the existential threat that we've got that we need to be concerned about. Now, when you combine that with what I would like to refer to as the perfect storm, this perfect storm is of a suite of uh, externalities. And these externalities include everything from uh, uh, climate change to the diminishing land and water resources to uh, changing incomes and diets, the need to minimize our ecological footprint. Oh, by the way, we want to guarantee that there are going to be positive health outcomes that result from this as well. And last but not least, uh, particularly in America, is this anti-science, anti-intellectual environment that we've got as well. So these externalities uh, are going to have an impact on how we're going to come up with ways to address this existential threat. And as I said earlier, that as we project out into the year 2050 or the year 2100, absent are coming together and addressing these externalities I don't think we're going to make very significant headway in addressing the existential threat. That's only going to continue to become exacerbated as well. So when you go from that sort of a global situation and these externalities that are going to exacerbate this existential threat that we've got, and then when we think about our production of food itself, I like to think that uh, from you know USDA's perspective, and particularly from NIFA's perspective, is that our producers, our farmers and livestock producers, are at the core of everything that we do. At the end of the day, for us, it is critically important that we want to bear in mind that these folks that are going to be producing our food, indeed, are going to also be profitable at the end of the day. So, but it turns out that these producers are almost caught in a, in a sort of a vice grip. And this vice grip is a whole bunch of abiotic factors, everything from climate change and the diminishing land and water resources, the droughts that we're seeing, the extreme weather events that we're seeing, all of these 
are the external non-living factors that are impacting our producers. And then when you combine that with the biological factors, these would be the different types of insects, the different types of pathogens, the different types of weeds, and <clears throat> excuse me, biological constraints. When you bring all that together, the, our producers are really caught uh, in this vice grip and so we have to determine the kinds of things that uh, uh, that can be undertaken, the kind of research that can be undertaken, the kind of uh, educational programs that can be undertaken that would help alleviate the sort of a pressure that our producers face, particularly because they are the core of our being able to address the existential threat of nutritional security itself. And uh, so it's not that, you know, it's a woe is me, what are we going to do about this? We've got a terrible situation, we're not going to be able to do anything about it. And then people that know me know that I'm the eternal optimist and we've demonstrably shown as humanity that every time these sorts of challenges have been put in front of us, humanity has risen to the occasion and we've been able to address these uh, challenges as well. And there is a path forward and this path forward uh, includes a uh, whole host of things that we should be addressing, everything from transformative discoveries to the kind of extension that we need. Extension itself is the translation of knowledge into innovations and solutions and that delivery mechanism. There's a continuum between the discovery process and the delivery process that we need to be very mindful of. And the farming systems that we need, the educational programs, uh, it's not just about the discoveries, but we also need to have people that come into continuing to discover the new knowledge, to become extension specialists and extension agents and educators. And oh, by the way, we also need to have people that will actually go and grow the, uh, uh, the foods that we need as well. And along with that, a whole suite of uh, uh, work that we need uh, to consider in regards to policies, regulation, marketing, uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, as you know, everybody knows, it's humans that make decisions and we've got to incorporate the human dimensions in the, uh, in the types of uh, endeavors that we undertake in addressing this existential threat. And last but not least, and maybe even probably the first thing that we might ought to think of doing is also communications. How do we engage with the public itself? The public has a, a significant amount of angst about the food that it consumes. And so how do we make sure that the public is engaged in the decisions that we make about the types of food that we're going to grow, about the approaches that we're going to use to grow that food as well? So we have to engage this, uh, uh, our public as well in, in thinking about how we're going to address this existential threat that we've got. <clears throat> so when you think about uh, the various challenges and, uh, and, and thinking of uh, historically what humanity has been able to do. In this graphic, I've shown you a timeline of the kinds of uh, inventions and discoveries that have taken place, these truly transformative inventions and discoveries, starting from when, uh, in quotes, agriculture was invented back about uh, six to 15,000 years ago. We've had all manner of inventions, you know, everything from the use of uh, uh, natural products as uh, pesticides to the uh, the discovery of uh, genetic mechanisms by Mendel, the unraveling of the uh, uh, structure of DNA by Watson and Crick, the development of uh, going, you know, morphing from animal-drawn power, powered tools to uh, fossil fuel-driven power tools such as uh, tractors and combines and things like that. And now in the in the 21st century, we've also had uh, discoveries in regards to uh, genetic sequencing and the ability to actually manipulate genes and uh, what we refer to as the Internet of Agricultural Things, that is smart systems that, uh, that are coming into vogue in the agricultural enterprise itself. All of these are basically part of our humanity's uh, legacy and as we project out, we've been actually able to address any and all of the challenges that have been placed in front of humanity. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to do this yet again in the context of this existential threat and the externalities that we need to be very mindful of. Indeed, this particular graphic here tells you the story. And uh, on uh, your left-hand side as you're viewing this, this particular graphic is uh, a, an image of Teosinte. The Teosinte is the ancestor of corn from the from Mesoamerica in uh, Mexico, in the Mexican highlands. And with that Teosinte is an American quarter and it tells you the size of that Teosinte itself. 
It uh, Tiocente has very, very small little grains that you can hardly get anything out of it to be able to actually consume it and to get any nutrients out of it. And then on the right hand side up on top is a modern ear of corn itself. And again, I you know draw your attention to the uh, quarter that is by the side of the uh, the, cor the corn of, uh, ear of corn, and you can see that human activity has allowed us to go from that little bitty teosinte into this nutrition-packed uh, ear of corn itself. And this was done by humans in Mesoamerica, and then along comes the scientific enterprise, particularly scientists at the uh, at Purdue University and University of Illinois and Iowa State University, and scientists with the Agricultural Research Service, one of the uh, agencies within the USDA itself. These scientists came up with a way, they figured out how to hybridize corn. And beyond that, there's been additional work that's been undertaken to where, if you look at the line graph that goes up, for a very long time, uh, you know, uh, corn production was around about 20 odd bushels of corn per acre. And today, in the year 2016, 2015, uh, 2016, it's up to about 180 bushels of corn per acre. And it's almost this exponential growth. And that, to me, epitomizes the ingenuity that humans have been able to bring to bear in coming up with the innovations that we need to address the sorts of challenges that we've got. And this only epitomizes what the possibilities are. I could use potatoes or uh, bananas and plantains or other species as well to demonstrate a similar sort of uh, uh, significant increases in yields and productivity that has taken place over the many, many, many uh, hundreds of years uh, as we've seen uh, agriculture and, and food systems uh, progress from where they got started uh, thousands of years ago. So when you think of this, our ability, humanity's ability to address uh, these challenges that have been thrown uh, at us, in the current context, in our ability to address this existential threat that we've got, uh, one of the areas that we need to be very mindful of is the ecological footprint of food and agriculture itself. And uh, we end up using, <coughs> excuse me, about 80% of the water, fresh water that we consume is in the food that we consume. And along with that, about 80% of the ammonia that is produced and emitted into the atmosphere is the result of the agricultural enterprise. And energy, we end up using almost about 20% of all the energy in, in making sure that food is available to us. And again, when you look at the production of greenhouse gases, about a quarter of all the greenhouse gases are the result of the agricultural enterprise itself. And one of the things that is critically needed are uh, basically to come up with ways to reduce that footprint itself. NIFA has uh, uh, created a, a, a vision and a path forward that we want to reduce this ecological footprint by about 50% in just the next about 15 to 20 years or so. And if that's our goal, if that's the outcome that we're interested in achieving, then there's a whole suite of uh, approaches that we might uh, consider that needs to be undertaken as well. And NIFA has a very significant role to play in this uh, as the public enterprise in the agricultural sciences and research and the discovery process that we need itself. NIFA uh, has this uh, vision uh, to catalyze transformative discoveries, uh, education and engagement, but really it's not for the sake of uh, knowledge. At the end of the day, these outcomes that we're desirous of is really to address these agricultural challenges, this existential threat that I've been referring to uh, throughout over the last uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. And, and we believe that there's got to be a connectivity between the discovery process and the solution process. And uh, absent that sort of a connectivity and the involvement of the translational process into innovation and solutions through our cooperative extension service, we're not going to make a whole lot of progress in addressing the existential threat uh, itself. And I like to say that what NIFA undertakes, the science that it undertakes, is inspired by the end users. It's not done in a vacuum. And that once the the discoveries are made once it's been translated into innovations and, uh, and solutions that it's being delivered and the end users are incorporating them into their own activities. These might be the farmers and the livestock producers or even your, you know, your parents, for example, in, in addressing the needs of children. And I like to say as a result of this that people's lives are being transformed. This transformation occurs in multiple parts of our society itself. Everybody from the producers all the way to the consumers 
we want to see their lives being transformed as, as well. So this is the the DNA that we have. This is the basis of what we do at NIFA in addressing this existential threat uh, of nutritional security itself. So I want to share with you a few thoughts about this user-inspired science over the uh, next uh, uh, few minutes <clears throat> and, and share with you the kinds of things that we're proposing to do over the next several years, particularly as it relates to addressing that nutritional security and, oh, by the way, also making sure that we're going to mitigate the ecological footprint uh, itself. So in thinking of the types of work that need to happen, this user-inspired science that needs to happen, I like to say that we've got some low-hanging fruit that we can address right now. And this low-hanging fruit is uh, food waste and food loss. And this graphic is a little complicated, but the bottom line is that uh, in developing countries, almost about a third to half the food is lost before the dinner table to insects and pathogens and rodents and other issues for lack of storage, transportation, the logistical challenges that people face in developing countries. In developed countries, in contrast, in the advanced economies of the world, such as the United States and Western Europe and other places, it turns out we're wasting about a third to half the food after the dinner table. And indeed, the Economic Research Service, one of the agencies within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, undertook an exquisite study last year, and uh, uh, they tell us that in America, we're basically wasting, as Americans, Collectively, we're wasting 131 billion, with a B, pounds of food per year. That translates into 1,200 calories of food per man, woman, and child per day. And as you know, your listeners know, uh, the average adult uh, needs only about 22 to 2,400 calories of food. Of course, in America, we consume about 38 to 4,000, 3,800 to 4,000 calories of food. Ergo, we've got the issues related to obesity and being overweight and things like that as well. But an average person to thrive, an average adult, needs only about 2,200 to 2,400 calories of uh, food. And so by wasting 1,200 calories of food per day, per man, woman, and child, we're basically wasting half the caloric needs of the average American. And uh, so in, in thinking of this situation that we've got, we, you know, we talk about, we hear words about to the effect that we're going to have to double food production, you know, in the next 40 years as the uh, population is projected to be about 9 plus billion people, maybe even up to 10 billion people. But the question is, right now, can we not cut our food loss and food waste at least in half, if not more? If we're to be able to do that, in fact, if we can eliminate food waste and food loss, we can pretty much produce all the food that we need, not only for now, but also projecting out into the year 2050 or beyond that as well. Oh, by the way, by cutting out this food waste and food loss, we can cut out the loss of about one quadrillion liters of water. Incidentally, one quadrillion liters of water, that equates to about seven times the volume of Lake Erie. And that's the amount of fresh water that we're wasting. Along with that, imagine the labor that went into it, the amount of nitrogen that went into it, the land that was used to produce that food. All of that literally is, is uh, in quotes, down the toilet. And, by the way, if you're to eliminate this food waste and food loss, it's like eliminating about 30 plus million automobiles off the roads. And by doing that, you can cut also the greenhouse gases that are being produced and contributing to and exacerbating climate change itself. These are low-hanging fruit. And in fact, uh, uh, Secretary Tom Vilsack, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack, and EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy have called on America that provided a challenge, issued a challenge on cutting food waste and food loss by half by the year 2030. And these are behavioral issues. You know, there are behaviors that we've all uh, become, you know, used to, and we throw a lot of our food, and it'll take some time for us to change this behavior. And indeed, NIFA has uh, started investing uh, funding in pr providing researchers across America and extension professionals ac across America to come up with innovative ways of having an impact on behaviors, coming up with innovative ways of developing the technologies to be able to track all the food and you know, eliminate food waste by uh, having shrink wrap, for example, that can tell you if your meat's gone bad or if your fruit and vegetables are still okay to consume. Uh, these are the sorts of things that need to be undertaken, and NIFA certainly has a role to play, and is uh, indeed in our uh, portfolio of funding, we're providing uh, funds for those sorts of endeavors as well. So this is the low-hanging fruit. 
Beyond this low-hanging fruit, of course, are some of the other transformative uh, discoveries that we need as well. We like to think that what we want to support over the next several years is to sustainably increase productivity and, oh, by the way, the word is not there, profitability of our producers as well. And we want to do this by help, you know, having, supporting the kind of discoveries that we need in increasing water use efficiency, in increasing nitrogen use efficiency, or the tolerance of droughts, and tolerance of uh, uh, various types of pests that might occur, these biotic constraints that I was referring to earlier. Or maybe we can uh, uh, figure out how to improve photosynthesis itself, that per unit of land that we could produce a lot more food. Also, we would like to support the diversification of agriculture itself. That is, we rely on the big five for our food across the globe. All of us pretty much consume rice, wheat, corn, potatoes, etc. And we think that it could potentially result in some disaster waiting in the wings to uh, essentially wipe out our food production capabilities. Again, remind the, the viewers here about what happened in Ireland back about 150 plus years ago when the Irish potato famine resulted in uh, pretty close to 2 million people that died as a result of the famines and about a million and a half people left Ireland to move to North America and Australia and other places as well. So we want to diversi diversify the kind of crops and livestock animals that are produced. And oh, by the way, America's demographics are changing as well. This demographic needs to be accommodated as well. We've got people that come from other parts of the world that we want to make sure that we provide them the opportunities to participate in producing our food and making it available to all of us as well. Along with that, we need transformative uh, approaches and protecting our uh, crops and livestock animals and, oh, by the way, in developing the, the uh, workforce that we need in uh, deploying the knowledge and producing value-added approaches so that farmers can enhance their incomes and enhance their, product, uh, their profitability itself. So these are the sort of areas that uh, we're going to invest in. And, and maybe during the Q&A session, people can ask me some questions uh, about the kind of examples uh, to provide as well. But what I want to do very quickly is to share with you some of the areas that we're going to be investing in regards to productivity, in addressing the non-living and living variables, using all the tools that are available to us. We don't believe that, it, uh, that we need to tie our hands behind our backs and say that any particular tool is going to be more important than another tool. We believe that, uh, uh, you know, in our toolkit, we want to have all comers bring their intellectual uh, capabilities to address this challenge of this existential threat. That could include everything from organic and sustainable approaches to conventional agricultural production systems as well. And, if it, and, and also the use of uh, uh, genetic enhancement and other biotechnological approaches uh, that we want to incorporate in addressing these biotic and abiotic variables. Along with that, uh, we, we will be making investments in helping promote uh, various types of tools, next generation tools that we need, uh, the data analytics tools that we need, the statistical tools that we need. And I like to think that what we're doing is we're morphing in the agricultural enterprise from an observational science to an information science to a predictive science. We want to be able to actually utilize all of the data available to us to be able to predict how a particular plant or animal will perform in a particular environment under a particular set of uh, management uh, techniques as well that are going to be deployed. And that's what the future is going to allow us to be able to produce the kind of food that we need to, this healthy food that has the appropriate traits in it, that is tasty, and can result in positive health outcomes uh, that uh, for, for people that are consuming the foods that, uh, that are available to them. We also believe that uh, these new techniques, these 21st century techniques of uh, gene editing and uh, doubled haploids, or these, there are new techniques that have come along here in just the last few years that allow us the ability to leapfrog. You know, these are just like the old selection methods that used to be done by hand, and it would take us 15, 20, 30 years to develop new varieties of crops and new breeds of animals and things like that. Now we can hasten that process 
by using these newer tools that we've got available. And so it's our it's our responsibility as an agency to provide the resources to allow this this universe of capabilities to be developed as well, so that indeed we can address that existential threat that I was referring to in the context of those externalities as well. The other aspects that uh, uh, that we're going to be investing in include everything from uh, promoting productivity and efficiencies, whether it's nitrogen use fix it, nitrogen use efficiency or water use efficiency, or the resistance and tolerance to uh, insects and pathogens and uh, increasing temperatures or the droughts, et cetera. Also, we're deeply interested in the traits. Uh, many of your uh, viewers, you know, probably raise uh, heirloom varieties of tomatoes or eggplants or uh, apples and things like that because they offer certain types of traits, uh, taste traits. And so we're investing significantly in this area as well to make sure that the food that's going to be produced doesn't taste like plastic, that indeed it tastes like uh, some of those heirloom varieties. And some of the work that's being done right now in multiple institutions across America are actually data mining those heirloom varieties and comparing them to the, the, the varieties that have been developed in the last few years and to see what the differences are and to see if those traits can be incorporated into varieties that are agronomically or horticulturally much more able to produce the kind of uh, food that we need in regards to productivity and also, by the way, uh, make sure that the producers are going to be profitable as well. So these new opportunity, new approaches and new opportunities we like to think are going to result from investing in understanding the phenomena and the underlying principles at the cellular level, at the organismal level, and at the community level itself. And eventually we're taking a comprehensive approach, a systems approach, to looking at uh, various aspects of organisms, of what they do in the environments that they're in. And by having this sort of a deep understanding, deep knowledge, we're going to be able to make uh, make the available tools that farmers need to produce the food that they need to produce. And by the way, these tools are critically important for a farmer who is uh, a limited resource, uh, a small farmer, or you know the big A agriculture farmer as well. So we're you know we're really interested in that entire continuum of uh, uh, farming enterprises. Hey, uh, uh, that camera's turned around. So I want to turn it. Uh, and so, sorry about that. I just, you know, reminded Arthur here that the camera fell off or something like that. That needs to be straightened out so you can, you can continue to maybe occasionally see my face as well. And uh, so, along with the biological uh, types of the biophysical types of work that need to be undertaken and the social sciences type of work that need to be undertaken, we're also investing in the development of smart systems. And there are a number of opportunities and challenges. Uh, we're investing in cyber physical systems and robotics, for example. Uh, you know, the, the challenge that our producers face is the cost of labor. And are there things that we can do in the realm of robotics? Again, the intent is to support the needs of small producers all the way up to the big A agriculture producers as well. And the development and deployment of sensors, whether it's for moisture detection or nitrogen detection or other sensors that we might uh, develop, and the opportunities that are going to be that are being afforded to us with in the realm of what I refer to as uh, big data itself. And again, we take the view that we need to have these sorts of transformative things happening from the farm to the dinner table in the entire food systems uh, itself. So I'm thinking of a 21st century farm uh, as we project out and thinking of the abilities that are being afforded us by these new techniques that we're investing in is a farm, this farm looks like any other farm except that it's got a whole bunch of sensors in it that's constantly emitting uh, information. Uh, we've provided funding for the development of robotics, as I said. These robots are able to go around, constantly monitor the environment in which those crops are growing, whether it's the occurrence of insects or pathogens or weeds, or the amount of nitrogen needed, or the amount of water needed. All of these are being triggered along with the use of drones to, uh, again, not only detect and monitor the environment of the situation, but also to make sure that uh, if there is need to, uh, for example, do a spot spray, you might be able to deploy the drones to go and spray that particular spot and not just go through blanketing the entire environment like we currently do using airplanes and, and uh, high boys and other uh, 
uh, spray equipment to spray large swaths of uh, the farmland itself. So much more precise uh, and much smarter in the decisions that we make as well. Here's an example of what one particular farmer, Randy Dowd, has been able to do using big data and analytics and all the genetics and pest control and everything coming together is Randy Dowd was able to produce 500 bushels of corn per acre. That particular year in 2014, the national corn yield average across America was 150, 71, 170 bushels of corn. Imagine the possibilities of bringing together these sorts of capability. And again, in thinking of the diminishing land and water resources, the increasing population, et cetera, that we might be able to deploy knowledge to be able to significantly increase uh, productivity. I want to give you a few examples of the sort of the types of things that have happened or are happening that are transforming lives. Uh, and I'll you know stop with that in just the next couple of minutes. Uh, in the realm of breeding and genetics, uh, uh, folks at multiple institutions across America are releasing new varieties of uh, wheat and barley. And uh, uh, these uh, varieties of wheat and barley, they constitute significant proportion of the acreage in the United States. Incidentally, these varieties are being developed for organic producers, for sustainable producers, for conventional producers. They're being deployed overseas as well in many, many developing countries. And along the way, in coming up with these new varieties of uh, wheat that can withstand the droughts, that can withstand the diminishing uh, water resources, that can withstand the occurrence of insects and pathogens and all that. Uh, they're also helping educate the future of our, uh, the future needs that we've got as well in regards to the workforce itself. In the area of uh, beef cattle, for example, we provided funding to the University of Missouri, and uh, they're looking at uh, utilizing beef genomics along with the rations that those cattle are on to come up with improved feed efficiency. Again, the intent behind this particular project is to reduce the amount of manure and reduce the greenhouse gases and at the same time enhance profits uh, for the producers as well because one of the outcomes of this is going to be the reduced uh, feed intake uh, by those uh, cattle. In another example, this is from North Carolina A&T University, which is a historically black institution in North Carolina, is the development of hypoallergenic peanuts. In America, we've got uh, a, a small uh, segment of our population that has peanut allergies, and using food grade enzymes, uh, these scientists have been able to develop the hypoallergenic uh, peanuts. And so the, the issue of uh, children having to suffer because of peanut allergies when other children are eating uh, foods that contain peanuts or other nuts, for example, could be mitigated uh, as well. So this is, again, having the sort of a transformative uh, impact on uh, people. In regards to water saving technologies, work being done at the University of Nebraska, there's enough water being saved by the research that's been done and the extension work that's been done to meet the needs per year for a city the size of Tucson, Arizona, by these new water saving technologies that have been developed with funding from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Along with that, uh, we're providing, uh, we've provided funding to uh, Carnegie Mellon University and other land grant universities across America to come up with uh, uh, robotics to pick uh, fruit, everything from apples, uh, large apples, down to small, soft blueberries as well. And again, the work that's being done that we are supporting in the area of robotics, uh, we've got projects uh, in multiple universities that are aimed at the organic and small producer segment of our production systems uh, as well. Again, labor tends to be a pretty expensive proposition, and having these sorts of robotic assist systems are critically important, regardless of the type of agriculture people are practicing. Citrus greening is basically destroying our nations, uh, particularly in Florida now, and it's also in Texas and California, is destroying our citrus uh, crops. And uh, uh, we're providing funding to various institutions across America to develop, for example, this one from the University of California, Riverside, is to develop citrus that are resistant to uh, citrus greening itself, this particularly devastating disease that we've got that's transmitted to uh, citrus plants by uh, an insect. In the area of biomass itself and the bioeconomy, we believe that along with food, farmers can also engage in the bioeconomy. And by so doing, we believe that they're going to be able to uh, in, you know, have additional income streams 
that allows them to be much more profitable as well. We've provided a significant amount of funding in the area of the bioeconomy. This is not just about bioenergy or ethanol itself. This is beyond ethanol. This is in these value-added possibilities that we've got that uh, is now being deployed across America. And uh, uh, nitrate test kits, uh, this is to avoid uh, nitrogen poisoning in livestock animals. When corn and other crops that are being grown for silage grows under drought conditions, it accumulates nitrates. And nitrates in large amounts, large quantities, are poisonous to uh, livestock animals. So this particular uh, uh, company uh, has developed a very simple, quick uh, test that has now been deployed. And in fact, the Environmental Protection Agency has approved it for use in farms. And it's been deployed in farms across America now. And last but not least is the work that we support in uh, helping develop uh, our children and our youth in America. We refer to this as positive youth development that we support. And many of your viewers uh, know about 4-H itself or probably have participated as 4-Hers in their own uh, lives uh, growing up across America. And uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, we support the 4-H program as well. So with that, I want to go ahead and uh, uh, switch and stop right here on this very last slide. Again, just a reminder to me and to all of you that the National Institute of Food and Agriculture's role is to help uh, catalyze transformative research and education and engagement. And the intent is not for the sake of knowledge, but really at the end of the day, is to transform lives. But that, I want to go ahead and stop and. Uh, Thanks very much again for having me here this after this morning, this afternoon, and uh, I'm now open for questions, Sarah. Thank you, Sunny. You covered a lot of in-depth information and a little bit of time, so thank you so much for that. We do have a lot of questions from our listeners, so we'll get through as many as possible, kind of rapid fire here in the next few minutes. Uh, I want to start by asking you a question from Valerie. She wants to know how NIFA and other governmental agencies are cooperating, for example, the DOE, EPA, uh, and FDA. Sure. Yeah. So, Valerie, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, we don't do NIFA and the other agencies, we don't do the work that we support uh, in a vacuum. We have these interagency working groups and interagency collaborations that we uh, engage with the other agencies. I'll give you one example. So, we partner with the National Science Foundation the, and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, in an area we refer to as the ecology and evolution of infectious diseases. Collaboratively, we provide funding to look at the development of knowledge and the tools to be able to deal with diseases that impact humans, plants, and livestock animals. And so we're doing this collaboratively, and uh, a great example of uh, uh, that is in the area of uh, foot and mouth disease, for example, that we've uh, invested money. And some of your viewers know, uh, Sarah and Mallory, that uh, honeybees, you know, we're having some issues with honeybees with colony collapse disorder. So we provided a collaborative sort of funding between NIH, NSF, and ourselves uh, for work to be done on honeybees to understand the the reason for why they're uh, having these issues with viruses and mites and nutrition and other things to Emory University in Atlanta as well. So those are a couple of examples of the sorts of things that we do in these interagency collaborations. I don't think anybody's got the market cornered. And I think the intent really, the approach that we've taken is we want to crowdsource the best knowledge and the best monetary resources to address these compelling challenges. Great. And our next question reads, how do you anticipate food and agriculture will be affected or could be affected by the next U.S. president? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm going to stay in my lane and say that uh, regardless of who is going to be sitting in the White House and regardless of who is going to be sitting in the secretary's chair, the secretary of agriculture's chair, people need to eat. As long as humanity is around, as long as people have to eat, we still have to come up with truly transformative approaches to make sure that the food that's being produced is wholesome, it's nutritious, it's healthy, and does result in those positive health outcomes. So it really doesn't matter who's around in office that will continue to invest in these sorts of resources. We take the sort of the long view rather than the political cycles. 
Thanks, Sunny. And the next question comes from uh, Jeanette, and her question is, what specific knowledge transfer strategies do you use to ensure research results are getting out to farmers and also to the consumer? Yeah. So, uh, again, you know, excellent question about uh, really it comes down to this idea that, first of all, we want to engage with the end users, these consumers, these customers, these end users. Find out what it is they need for us to do. So we do that. That's the user-informed information that we take. And we do that through cooperative extension service. We do that through listening sessions. We hold formal and informally, informal listening sessions. We take all that input. And then we take that information, boil it down into priorities for investing our funding. And then we take the, fund, the investments and we offer it up to people across America. Again, it's about uh, crowdsourcing the best intellectual resources. The research, the discoveries are under, the research is undertaken for the discoveries that we need, the knowledge that we need. Once those discoveries are uh, made and the knowledge has been generated, again, it needs to be translated and needs to be delivered to the end users. We use, again, multiple means, one of which, of course, is the Cooperative Extension Service which has a portal in every one of the 3,143 counties, boroughs, and parishes in America. But in addition to the Cooperative Extension Service, we also use a number of non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations as well. And uh, so we have a you know, multiplicity of approaches that we use to make sure that the knowledge is actually being translated and being delivered as well. So there's a, a nice connectivity, I like to say, the continuum between the discovery process and the delivery process is critically important for us. Thanks, Sunny. Uh, the next question comes from a listener in Vermont, and they want to know, the standard American diet is meat-heavy and highly processed. The U.S. dietary guidelines and other resources have started to incorporate things like sustainability and plant-based foods into their process. However, corporate interests still shine through. Can you speak about nutritional guidelines and how that also affects consumer food choice and the health of our environment? Sure. Yeah. So the, the approach that we take with NIFA is, you know, we don't create the policies. We don't create the dietary guidelines. We don't tell the research is going to go and support the interests of Monsanto or ADM or Cargill or somebody. What we're deeply interested in are two parts. One is the producers of the food. And the second is the consumers of that food. And with that being the approach that we take, we provide funding for testing these policies and regulations and things like that. So we give money to various institutions across America, both academic and non-academic organizations, to, to look at whether it's the dietary guidelines, are they appropriate in the context of whatever it is. That's the approach that we've taken. And, and truly, we also have uh, oversight by various groups. For example, there's a, a, a congressionally mandated uh, committee called the National Agricultural Research Extension uh, Education and Economics Advisory Board. We, for short, it's the NARI Board. And this NARI Board is vested with the responsibility by Congress to make sure that the work that we support is not duplicative and it is relevant. And oh, by the way, that it's not meeting the interests of the corporate sector, that it is indeed at the end of the day meeting the interests of the average consumer. Thanks, Sunny. And the next question reads, how do we encourage children, especially those born in the first part of this century, to take a greater interest in food and agriculture, especially encouraging more young people to become involved in farming? Sure. Yeah, wonderful question. And we've been very, very concerned about this as well. And, and as you know, Sarah and, and, and your listeners and your viewers know, across America, we're about three generations removed from the farm. And so there's greater and greater disconnect with uh, food, where it comes from, how it's made, the blood, sweat, and tears that go into making the food, et cetera. And uh, so we have a number of programs that we provide funding for, and, and we lament as well, along with the person that asked that question, about getting our young people to become more engaged, more knowledgeable, more involved in the food and agricultural enterprise itself. And we have a number of programs that we support, one of which I referred to right towards the end of my uh, formal comments about 4-H itself. We've got approximately about six plus million children in the 4-H program. Along with that, we also offer uh, uh, the, 
you know, what used to be called the Future Farmers of America is now called just simply, very simply, FFA. And we have about half a million children in the FFA programs across America. Along with that, we also support what we refer to as the Agriculture in the Classroom program. And the Agriculture in the Classroom program, again, has about several million children involved in it. And the intent behind these programs really is to en enhance the awareness of young people about food and agriculture. Incidentally, there's not only in the rural communities, it's also in urban communities. If you, in fact, look at 4-H uh, itself, you know, about 50% of the uh, uh, effort occurs in urban communities. And we're particularly wanting to help, uh, you know, urban children learn more about food. And uh, uh, the way we do our work, that NIFA does its work, is through, by engaging uh, academic and non-academic uh, organizations and individuals to bring their intellectual capabilities to address these sorts of questions. And so we provide funding, and, uh, and, and if you're, you know, the person that asked that question is, is interested in learning more about the kind of funding that we offer to uh, enhance opportunities for young people to become more knowledgeable and become more engaged in the food and agricultural enterprise, they might have to send me an email. My email address, I'll give it to you now. It's sunny, S-O-N-N-Y, at nifa, N -I -F -A dot USDA dot gov. Send me an email. You know, I, I love to look forward to, I look forward to receiving many, many emails from your uh, listeners and viewers. Thanks, Sunny. And we have time for just two more questions. So the next one reads, what are some of the most exciting technological developments you've seen that are either in creation or already available for use? Oh, wow. <laughs> There's a whole suite of them. There's a bunch of them that are happening right now. Uh, one of them I'd like to say is probably in the area of smart systems. And uh, uh, give you one example of that that's been deployed. And then I'll also share with you, uh, you know, examples from other area in, in regards to in the, in the world of genetics and, and genomics itself. The smart systems, uh, in, in one of the examples I showed you, uh, I talked about the work being done by Carnegie Mellon University, Washington State University, Oregon State University, and, the, and Purdue University scientists in helping develop robotics. And these robots, the first iteration of it, has really been developed for orchard crops, particularly uh, tree fruit. And uh, they can go in and pick those apples or pears or peaches. And as you're, you know, uh, the person that asked the question knows, labor is a very significant cost uh, to our producers and again in America much of the farm labor comes from south of the border and uh, that makes it challenging as well because of the immigration laws or the lack thereof in our nation so the, these robotic systems are critically important as a tool for farmers to use and the the additional robots being made that can pick either a hard apple about the size of my hand that I'm holding here or down to a soft little blueberry or maybe even a grape itself. The mechanization that's taking place, the, the ability to pick between a hard apple and a, blue, uh, a soft blueberry is critically, critically different and really difficult to make happen. So what they've developed are uh, the sense of vision to see that the fruit is actually ripe. And the next generation will also include the sense of smell to uh, smell the ripening fruit itself and then the tactile part of it, which is to say if it's squishy or hard or the size of it, all of this is incorporated into an algorithm that allows that robot to now be deployed in a blueberry production system or in an apple production system. That's something that's deployed now. It's actually available for purchase. Uh, and many orchardists, uh, particularly up in the Pacific Northwest, are actually investing uh, money into purchasing these robots. And we're seeing more and more of those uh, here in, in Virginia, for example, where I live in Virginia, right next door to the District of Columbia. Uh, we've provided funding for development of smaller robots that can help uh, with blueberry producers and blackberry producers and raspberry producers and strawberry producers. And again, the intent is it's focused on the smaller producers, the local food systems types as well. So that's one deployment of uh, technology that's really, really exciting because it's going to reduce uh, the cost of labor very significantly. Conversely, in the world of uh, uh, genetics itself, I dare say that uh, the development of uh, uh, genetic modification is a seminal event 
that took place. Again, we provided funding for it back about uh, 30 plus years ago uh, for the initial work that was done by uh, uh, Mary Dell Chilton and uh, Mark Van Montague and Robert Fraley and others. And like they say, the rest is history. And that, I think, is a definitive transformative uh, 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 technology that has resulted in some incredible gains in productivity for us. Thanks, Sunny. And our last question is from a listener in New York. And they ask, how do we address the existential threat as consumers? What small or large decisions can we make on an individual level? And then I just want to open it up for you there at the end, too, if there's anything else you want to add uh, before, we, before we close. Yeah. Oh, again, an excellent uh, question. I think at the end of the day, our ability to ex address this existential threat of nutritional security comes down to the individual consumer. And that's where it needs to start. And it needs to start in being much more mindful about the food that we consume. If you have not read it, I'd encourage you to read a really funny book by a guy named Brian Wansink, W-A-N-S-I-N-K. He's at Cornell University. And the title of his book is Mindless Eating. And you might want to go get yourself a copy of it. It's funny, and you'll get a kick out of reading it. Brian is somebody that we've provided funding to, and he's a behavioral economist. And he's the guy, by the way, that came up with, uh, based on observations and all that, of remove from, from checkout counters uh, in stores, to remove candy bars and put fruit out there, you know, like bananas and apples and things like that. He's also, along with others, the guy that came up with the idea that at, at school lunches in, in cafeterias, to have fruit and vegetables on the front of the line, and oh, by the way, not to leave a big fat apple that a child can't even hold nor uh, leave alone take a bite into it because they got such small mouths, that you could go ahead and cut it up into smaller slices and have those slices of apple or other fruit available as well. It turned out in observations that he and others made, many of those apples were going in the trash can. And here by very simply cutting it up into smaller pieces, uh, you're able to enhance the consumption of those apples. So it's at the consumer level. And so consumers certainly have a very significant role to play. So being very mindful of the food that we eat, being mindful of uh, the number of calories we consume, again, going back to this mindless eating, uh, we in America love to eat a lot of food. If you look at the portions that we have in restaurants and, and other places, it's huge. Half the food, every time I go to a restaurant, I see half the food at every table is left, and all of that ends up in the trash can. And there's some lessons learned, I dare say, from the French uh, and other Europeans on reducing our portion sizes. And again, as an individual consumer, uh, you and I can ask the uh, waiter, to get us a smaller portion because definitely I'm going to you know, get rid of it. Or better yet, maybe if you do get the same portion because you know they can't cook any smaller portions, is to ask for a box to go so you can cut the food and get the food in there before you stick your you know grubby uh, fork and knife into it and your spit and everything else that you know might pose some uh, food safety issues later on. So these are simple things that one can do as well. And last but not least is to tell people like me and the others involved in this uh, food and agricultural enterprise as to the issues that you want us to deal with as well. Thanks, Sunny, and thank you so much for joining Food Tank today. It's truly been a pleasure to have you here, and thank you to all of our listeners for sending in their questions. Hope you all have a great rest of your week, and hopefully we'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.